Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for July 20th, 2020. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic, whose line is it anyway? Problem solving in complex networks with Doug Southworth. Doug is a network systems analyst for the international networks at Indiana University and works on EPIC. Uh, EPIC is the Engagement and Performance Operations Center. Uh, he will be explaining a little bit more about what EPIC does uh, in the introduction. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. Uh, first, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, just click on chat and a, the window will appear. Uh, and we have time for questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Doug. Doug, welcome. Jeanette, thank you. Appreciate uh, the introduction there and the opportunity to speak. Um, honestly, it was really excited when you all reached out and uh, invited Epic in, uh, just because a lot of the work we do actually crosses over with Trusted CI. And as we'll outline here in the presentation, um, we've actually used you in some of our case, you know, resources from Trusted CI and some of our interventions and training in the past year. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Let me start the presentation first. And let's share the actual screen. Okay, so I believe it's time for the obligatory. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, looks good. <laughs> Uh, also, I think as is customary with Zoom meetings during the pandemic, I will apologize in advance for my dogs who may or may not respect our meeting time here. So what you signed up for today, we're going to do an introduction and problem statement, and then we'll move into what Epic is. Give an example of what's probably our most popular activity that we engage in, our roadside assistance. And then we're going to spend some time on lessons learned, uh, just what the, the past two, two and a half years in Epic has happened to bring forward in terms of uh, just things we've figured out, things that we believe can help the larger community and areas where other people can uh, pitch in and help us with our efforts. So first question, of course, is why do we even need an engagement and operations center? What's, what's the point there? Well, today's science is collaborative. It is spread out all over the globe. You have researchers on different continents using shared data sets. Uh, maybe they're just spread across a country, but even that's a fairly large gap compared to what we had, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Tons of points of connection. You have uh, cooperation between different agencies. All these things come together in how modern science gets done. And because of that, because of the better access to data that today's researchers have, we start to ask harder questions about the science. We can del delve deeper into things. We can ask questions that honestly, we couldn't ask even 10 years ago, or in some cases, even five years ago. So as that continues to grow, that changes the science that we do, the very science we engage in. Um, so in some ways, this kind of ties into, you know, the, the idyllic Star Trek vision of science where you could be anywhere in the universe, uh, any place, any time, and be interactive with your colleagues in, real t colleagues in real time. And I guess that's kind of the downstream dream, but it's starting to become a little bit more of a reality now. So because of that, the network really is now an instrument. It's not just infrastructure. Uh, I don't think anybody here has a particle accelerator in their backyard, but they do have a really nice one over in Geneva. The, the network is now part of that instrument. It links CERN to the rest of the world. And so we have connectivity has been around for a while, but connectivity is just the first step. Being able to connect to a place like CERN or Fermilab here in the U.S. or any of the other major uh, instruments, astronomy is a, a prime example of instruments that are spread all over the globe. You have listening posts uh, at different places uh, dotted across the globe and you need to be able to access that data. So now the network is actually part of the instrument. It is not just infrastructure. So once we build it, once we get everything connected, 
usability is the piece that has to come next. It is not, it's not enough to just have everything linked up and say that we're done, the data is accessible, we're gonna move on. The next goal that we need to tackle is how can people actually use this? How do they have access to it? Along those lines, understanding end-to-end -end performance is really, really hard to do anymore. There's a ton of pieces. It's, it's easy to assess end-to-end -end performance when the two ends are on your own campus or maybe even in your uh, regional end run or something along those lines. There's lots of pieces though now when you're talking about science that's spread across the country and even across the globe. There's no one place that controls all these pieces. Uh, no one person has access to every router, every switch along the way. And performance expectations vary. Just because you have a 10 gig link coming out of your university, does that mean you're going to get a 10 gig transfer across the globe? What should we really be expecting? That's a, something that's hard to assess on an end-to-end -end basis. Then you get into the whole uh, the kind of Gordian knot of soft failures. Is the performance bad because uh, there's failing equipment in the way, failing optics, has performance degraded over time? Is this really just the best we could possibly get? Figuring this out requires a lot of coordination across a lot of different groups. And that's where Epic starts to come in and be able to tie those pieces all together. So this is just an example of what I was talking about. If you were doing a transfer from my office at Indiana University to one of our partners over in Thailand, uh, I control exactly none of that network actually, but I have access to people at Indiana University who do, so I have some influence there. But beyond that, there's a bunch of moving parts and pieces here that I have no control over. I am basically at the mercy of who's ever running that network to be able to uh, solve a problem I'm having, and maybe I just don't have the right connections to be able to get from hop to hop to hop to figure out what exactly is going on. So I've alluded to it a little bit, but we'll talk here about what EPIC actually is. So EPIC is a joint project between IU and ESNet. We were awarded a three-year grant as part of the CC STAR program for domestic science. Uh, we form partnerships with regional uh, science communities spending, spanning the different NSF and DOE continuum of funding. We've, we've basically tried to branch out and embrace the scientific and research community at large. Uh, we are currently in year three. Uh, I believe our year two just ended in March. So we're just starting out into year three here. So we've got five main focus areas that we uh, are involved with and they vary in intensity from just simple problem answering to you know maybe you drop us an email and we can give you a quick answer all the way into really intensive uh, deep dives where we are looking into you know the nitty-gritty of how science is being done and we'll, we'll talk about all these pieces and parts and how they fit together but basically we cover a wide range of uh, activities to try and support science. If there's a need, we, we believe that it fits into one of these five categories. So the RA process that we are going to get into in a little more in depth here in a little bit is effectively kind of what the first line there says, this used to work, but now it doesn't. What's going on? So these are usually started by a researcher or uh, someone in the field that is having a problem. Anyone can submit. If you're involved in research and education, then you can submit uh, a request to epic at iu.edu. Within 24 hours, we assign a case manager and a lead engineer to that case so that you have a point of contact. And because these types of network troubleshooting and problem solving require different resources from different institutions and different organizations, Epic focuses, base, Epic can be thought of as a lens that focuses that effort. We bring together the different expertise from different areas, whether that's in-house or other uh, places that we partner with like Trusted CI, and we put the right people together to make sure that we can solve the issue on an end-to-end -end basis so that at the end of the day, a researcher or scientists can get their work done. So consulting is kind of a similar process. Uh, consulting is basically a lighter weight version. Maybe you don't need five P 
people or five different institutions and 20 different people involved in your, your transfer or science issue. Maybe you just need some advice. Uh, how should I size this DTN? Uh, looking at putting in some sort of DMZ or a science DMZ, I need some guidance. I've read the white papers, but I have a couple questions about these specific things. What kind of performance should I be expecting? I've, I've got these test results and I don't know if this is actually good or bad. What do you, you know, I just need an opinion on how this looks. So consulting is available uh, as well. Similar process. You're going to have a single point of contact on that, but uh, just not as in-depth and heavy duty. Deep dives are probably the most intensive type of uh, activity that we do. So a deep dive strives to understand the entire science process that a researcher is doing and then understand the pain points and the pinch points that are preventing them from doing that science. So the deep dives themselves, the end point of the deep dive actually takes place in person. We don't do these online. These, we found that these actually work far, far better if we handle these in an actual, you know, the setting that the researcher is in. But it starts before that. We send out questionnaires, very detailed questionnaires, to both the campus cyber infrastructure uh, engineers and anybody involved in that side of things, and then to the researchers as well. So on the research side, we want to know kind of just an overview of the facility, what type of science is being performed, who your collaborators are, uh, different people and institutions that uh, your partic particular science group is interacting with. What type of instrumentation are you using? Uh, is the instrumentation local or remote? And then we kind of ask the researchers to put that all together and give me a, a day in your life. When you're doing research, from the time you enter your lab or your facility to the time you leave, what does a day look like when you're, when you, you know, walk us through the actual process of the science, how you're inputting data, where you're drawing data from. And then through that process, we start to understand again, where the pain points and the pinch points are. Sometimes it's just through analysis, kind of looking at their process and going, well, there's probably a better way to do that. Maybe we should investigate that. And sometimes the scientists just talking about it, it just kind of comes out in conversation, as it were, where they will be writing about their process and then they'll say something along the lines of, and this is always a pain when I have to do this. So we really want to understand their side of the story of what specifically they're going through. And then on the network side, um, let's, oh, sorry, moved a the slide there, I didn't mean to. We also want to know the more technical aspects as well. Uh, what kind of software infrastructure there is? How about the network and the data architecture? Do you have large scale storage on campus? Uh, are you storing stuff locally in a specific lab? What kind of cloud services are you using? Uh, what kind of HPC resources are you using? Uh, what kind of you know, outstanding issues and uh, pain points do you have right now? Or maybe you've asked for support and have not gotten it. And that, and that works on both sides of the coin, whether that's researchers or CI, because sometimes we run into uh, CI has made requests and they have not been addressed as well. So we really want to understand both sides of the coin, the entire picture as well as we can before we set foot on campus. And so one of the interesting things that we pulled out of that is we often identify that the issues really have nothing to do with the technology available and a lot to do with the culture or maybe you know interactions between people effectively uh, to steal a phrase from cisco the human network honestly is as troublesome as the actual physical network So we also go, we have a, a hand in network instrumentation and analysis. Uh, we really can't start asking questions about performance and expectations and problem solving until we have some base data to work with. And so for us, this, the two main things that we look at are the uh, per global personal deployment, which you can find a whole directory of the disposition of the available nodes at uh, that URL there, the my.es.net. Uh, Personar has proved to be invaluable in not just bandwidth testing, but trace routes and one-way latency and finding um, 
asynchronous routes and just a lot of good base information we glean from Personar. Uh, we also use uh, the NetSage framework, which is NetSage is another project that I'm actually a developer on. I've uh, developed some uh, performance dashboards for it. And what NetSage does is it pulls together SNMP, Personar, Flow, TSTAT, any kind of data you want to put in there, we are able to pull that together. That data is then anonymized down to a class C. So we do not know the specific IP address that this data is coming from and nobody can use NetSage to pinpoint a specific machine. But we can say that yes, this data is coming from a specific university um, and uh, tied in with our science registry, which is an optional area where researchers and scientists and universities can add in project specific data that they can kind of flush that data out a little more that we know if it's registered in the science registry we know that this these specific flows are tied to say the atlas project or some specific project we take all that data consume it anonymize it and then we perform uh netsage puts out uh, dashboards that allow you to quickly and easily visualize that performance. Um, a lot of times we're, you know, institutions are very good at collecting data, but it sits in a hard drive somewhere and making sense of it is hard. Uh, NetSage basically tries to make this a valuable tool, you know, that data put it to use. So you can jump to the all.netsage.global and that is, as the name would imply, that is every single sensor that we collect data from. Uh, presented all in the same spot. One caveat to that, there is a selectable time range. Please don't select like the last two years of data with every test point we have because you will probably bring our poor cluster to its knees. Um, sensible time frame for all the data is probably between, you know, the last seven days and maybe out to three months. Last area we're going to touch on real quick is service in a box. Basic idea is uh, we want to be able to offer services to maybe smaller institutions that don't have the funding or the, the knowledge on campus to do specific operations. So maybe we can package up perf sonar or a science DMZ or something along those lines and actually present it as a working drop-in pluggable product for a university that uh, just needs some help. And sometimes this is just a cost issue. Maybe they don't have enough money in a specific budget to implement something they want, but they can push that cost further up the chain by taking it out of a different budget because they're hiring a consultant or a contractor or something along those lines. One quick, quick example is our science portal. This is one of our in a box solutions. And the science portal is fully integrated with Globus. Uh, it can be deployed with Docker or bare metal in about an hour. And it basically pulls in Globus endpoint data sets. So if your researcher is involved in specific research, they can log into the science portal and they can see the relevant data sets that are available. So as opposed to knowing they have to initiate a transfer with a specific DTN or a specific partner or something along those lines, this can almost be thought of like Dropbox for uh, research data. They log in, they, they can select the specific data they're interested in and pull it down. So that's being tested right now at about three different locations. And so far things look good. Uh, once we have that completely done, we will push that out to the wider audience. We also do training for Personar, how to do deep dives, DT, uh, DTN, DMZ setup, anything that we engage in, we are willing to train you on as well. Uh, I think the ideal situation would be if everybody knew enough that we put ourselves out of a job. So if that's something you're interested in, we can also do training as well. And we will work with absolutely anybody out there. You don't have to be a partner. You don't have to be DOE funded. You don't even have to be in the continental United States. And it doesn't cost you anything. We received a CC star grant. This is our job. This is what we do. If you need help or somebody you know needs help, that's why we're here. So last slide I'll leave in here. Just uh, our, the slides will be available after the talk if they haven't been posted already. But if you need to get a hold of us, there's no wrong way to do that. The email is the easiest way. Uh, but if you know somebody and want to drop a phone call or you run into us at a conference, you know, those things we used to go to before the pandemic, then um, you can run into us there and drop us a line as well. There's no wrong way to get a hold of us. Uh, any questions before I move on any further?
Okay. Okay. Question here is NetSage data between DTNs. We have we collect TSTAT data uh, data from specific DTNs. So the answer is yes. If we have developed a partnership and we are allowed, uh, you know, access to that. So. Um, the answer is kind of a limited yes, but we do have the ability to digest and process DTN and uh, flows as well. That's all I see so far. So please continue. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So roadside assistance, we're going to jump in here because this is our probably our most popular activity that we engage in because it doesn't necessarily require us to be on site, uh, especially lately being on site is not something that any of us can do. Um, but it does allow us to solve complex problems across large networks. So again, like we touched on earlier, a lot of the problems aren't just on off. Maybe it's a soft failure. Maybe it's an intermittent problem. Sometimes we just don't even really know what the end goal is. And so we need to start bringing in uh, several different people to find out what the specific issue is and what, what we're really looking to improve upon. So with roadside assistance, we're able to focus that effort because now there's a single point of contact and that case manager actually does a write up of the entire problem, the all the people that are involved and we put that in a Google shared folder and then all the other documentation comes in as well. So every partner who's involved in the process actually has access to the documentation and knows what's going on from start to finish. And if they had something to add or something to put in there, they can do that as well. So I used this example recently in another talk I gave, but because it's fresh in my mind, you get recycled content, uh, but it really highlights how well the roadside assistance program works. So in this particular one, we had a researcher at Iowa State University who was working with real-time uh, NOAA Earth observation data. And when they got a hold of us, they said, look, we need, I need 80 megabit sustained to do this in real time. 320 megabit would be great. I would take 80 if I could get it, but I've noticed that over time, the performance is dropping off. And just over the past couple months, we're now getting down to like 32 megabit at times where the data is just unworkable. We don't have the connection speed to get from A to B. So we did some initial data gathering. We worked with uh, engineers on site and with Epic and uh, ISU was very responsive and installed personal Personar toolkit on their file transfer server right in the lab. And that's one of the key points. This was the end point for the data transfers. So bandwidth results looked good one direction. They looked terrible coming from UCAR back to ISU. Lots of retransmits, poor performance, asymmetric routing. Things that until these questions have been asked, we're probably masked. Uh, so maybe the asymmetric routing and a few other things probably didn't develop immediately, uh, but they were probably hampering performance even before this call went out. So with these findings, we go back to the ISU CI staff and their WAN engineer, interestingly enough, confirmed that they had made recent changes to their internet to uh, GP and GPN connections. So Great Plains had actually provided them uh, a circuit back to Internet 2, and that configuration had been changed. And the timeline lined up exactly with when the researcher said their performance had nosedived. We found packet fragmentation along the way, jumbo frames being dropped or fragmented. And so based on that, we actually put a few more perfs on our nodes in the path so we could start isolating where in the path we were having a specific issue. Because at this point, it was starting to look more and more like a campus level issue and not a issue, you know, that was on UCAR's end or somewhere in between. So we, uh, like I just said, we found out it was confined to the campus. Um, we ended up taking a look at operating systems and found some out of date uh, OSs on switch gear and some other network gear along the way. So ISU engineers went ahead and updated those things and we made a few configuration changes and the numbers started to improve. Still not consistently where the researcher needed them to be. So the final pieces. We found out that the 10 gig GPN provided link to I2 was actually congested. Uh, when, we, when we asked ISU to, you know, engineers to take a look at that, they, 
found out that they were using way more bandwidth on average than they believed they were. And that link was really starting to suffer. So they actually reached out to GPN, got more bandwidth, and now they have a 100 gig connection back to internet too. Uh, the Agronomy Hall, which is where this researcher was based, they actually were able to go through and replace the entire switching infrastructure. After looking at the updates they had made and the uh, pieces and parts that were put in place there, they realized that really this, this software is, or the uh, hardware is getting kind of long in the tooth and isn't up to snuff with doing long distance transfers. Um, and that's something we find fairly commonly that Cut what we call data center type switches, which have very, very small buffers that work fine on campus where you're, you know, you maybe got between one and three milliseconds of latency. But when you start doing transfers that are even only 15 to 20 milliseconds away, they just don't have enough buffering to keep up with a, a transfer like that. So they replaced switches with a little more beef to them. And then they also normalized the network path. So the asymmetric routing we were finding was actually on campus, that it was leaving campus one direction and coming back at another. So we worked with them to normalize that routing uh, infrastructure there in, on campus and make sure everything was moving along the same path. So at the end of the day, their average transfer rates rose to over 600 megabits. And more, most importantly, this ISE researcher was actually able to do their research again. And that's really why we're here. We wanna make sure 110% that any researcher that's out there is able to do their work. That's the only reason we're doing any of this. So that's just kind of a qu one quick example of the type of intervention that Epic is, uh, able to do through the roadside assistance progress and or process. And so you can imagine that the deep dive process, which is even more intensive, we tend to uncover even more detail about what's really going on with a, a researcher and the type of science they're doing and who they're collaborating with and how that's either working or not working. So most of it's just taking the time to understand the, the entire process and then just find the right people to talk to. There's people out there that are interested. There's people that are out there that want to help. We just kind of try and focus that effort and bring it all into one spot. So I'll pause there again if there's any questions. Okay, we're gonna... Oh, look, we got another one. Okay. <laughs> Has Epic ever encountered network data integrity issues during any of their engagements? We haven't, we haven't encountered that as something specific that has turned up during a, um, either a deep dive or roadside uh, assistance or anything like that. We have actually been able to assist, and I'll get into that into the next section here. Um, we actually have been able to head some of those off at the pass up front where we've had people approach us and say, look, we are looking at doing this specific thing. We need some advice on how to make sure that this is secure and how to make sure that, uh, you know, we're protecting our data. We want the science DMZ or whatever the thing is to work, uh, but we need to make sure that we're doing it the right way. So, so far we haven't had any demonstrable pointed to, wow, you've got a huge security concern here, but we have definitely uh, had people ask us up front for help in that arena. I think the person is clarifying the data integrity in the sense of correctness, uh, as in the data ah, okay. maybe wasn't okay. uh, tampered or manipulated. I'm sorry, I misunderstood there. Uh, Similar answer, no, we actually have not uh, encountered that directly in any of our interventions thus far, but it is something that we do try and pay attention to. Um, and that is some of the, we get into that a little bit more in the deep dives and that's something when we have uh, talks with the researchers, you know, we can flush out a little more and ask them specific questions like that. Have you, have you had issues where the data isn't what you're expecting or you believe that's been tampered with? So far, thankfully, that answer has been no, but it is something that we do look at. A couple more questions. One, how welcome was the help from the campus network? How did they receive your offer of help? At ISU, very, very responsive. They were willing to install Personar nodes along the network. They were allowed, you know, they were happy to uh, walk through us with every single 
um, step of the the path basically you know we said hey can we try upgrading these the os on this uh specific switch you know they would go ahead and do that okay maybe we can replace this switch they would go ahead and do that so it they actually were really really responsive that that's not always the case it just depends on a case-by-case -case basis but usually they're coming since a researcher on the specific campus is usually coming to us um they've basically they've for the most part have been receptive and in this case was a really good case example of that uh, another question has epic been able to create a list of network problems commonly seen by the scientists uh, to help with root cause analysis we have um i don't think i threw that slide in here and maybe should have but what we typically find network wise is MTU match mismatches are extremely common. Uh, just because you have jumbo frames in, enabled on your leg of the network does not mean that the end-to-end -end path has jumbo frames enabled. So that's a big one. Um, switch buffering, which I talked about a little bit. Uh, buffer sizes are often a mismatch for the intended use case. Um, those are probably the two biggest ones that we run into on a consistent basis in terms of transfer and performance issues. And one more question, is there a programmatic method to access NetSage data by network researchers? Um, can you read the question again? Sorry. Sure. Is there a programmatic method to access NetSage data by network researchers? Not necessarily. Um, what I found with NetSage is that everybody has kind of a different take on how to use it and how to extract the data that they want to. NetSage is pretty user friendly and we've tried to, the way we look at NetSage is every dashboard is developed asking a question. It's an answer to a question. And that question may be, how is my research data, you know, how is my research data being used um, in terms of a specific project? Like how is, is this data related to this sp specific project? Or is my institution communicating with this specific country or how are data links being used across these specific continents? So everything in NetSage is based around answering a question. And that's the way we've approached trying to build the dashboards and uh, work things up. So in a sense, that's the programmatic approach is if you have a question, you'll probably be able to find a specific answer there. In fact, if you go to NetSage and look on the left-hand side and click the menu, you will see that the, the dashboards aren't labeled uh, flows by organization or flows by institution. They're actually labeled with what kind of question are we trying to answer here? We'll take you to the right spot to find it. Please continue. Thank you. So we'll jump through here fairly quick. Uh, agenda item lessons learned. And I say when we all win, we all win. That's really one of the probably the take home point I want to drive through this section is that uh, there's wins for all of us here. And if we all work together with researchers and cyber infrastructure and security and everybody else who's involved, then the end result is everybody gets to take a win home to their specific department. So probably the biggest thing we've learned along the ways is that we do need partners to scale engagement, whether that's regional infrastructure, science community partners, Epic does, you know, is a focal point for these specific engagements, but we don't have enough expertise and we don't have enough breadth of knowledge and we don't have enough context just internal to Epic to solve every problem out there. And able to engage with researchers, we need the involvement of the entire scientific community, basically, because then we can start sharing knowledge and lessons that we've learned between the communities, just like we're doing here today. Uh, finding, you know, support that fans that spans uh, federal funding bodies has been important. There's all sorts of different aspects here where we realize the more and more we work with different institutions, that what we really, really need is a larger pool to draw from. And so these type of engagements like we're doing right here, where we've got two institutions that both have a vested interest in furthering science, the more we talk, the more we communicate, the better we both end up being. 
So these are some examples actually of just that. In the past year, we've had four different epic engagements where we've called upon uh, Trusted CI as a partner. And I'm gonna apologize here because I shorthanded a couple of things that I realize now I should have spelled out. The first two UMs are University of Michigan and the last UM is actually um, Montana. So <laughs> I just kind of did a copy paste and I knew what these meant and all of a sudden about two minutes before the presentation I realized I should have spelled those out. But the first two at University of Michigan they had some questions about their net bacillus security project and they wanted to understand data transfer implications. We brought in experts from Trusted CI. So Epic was the phone call they made but we literally handed it to some people from Trusted CI that were able to give them the information they needed. Uh, similar uh, type of case, uh, Michigan reached out to us about building a HIPAA compliant science DMZ, which science DMZ has a lot of questions anyways about security, which I know a lot of people on this call are familiar with. Now you add in the HIPAA component and people really wanna make sure that their data is accessible to the right people and only the right people. Uh, and then UCF University of Central Florida, uh, again, had a science DMZ question. And this one ended up being a little, uh, little broader in scope. But again, we were able to use experts from Trusted CI. And uh, that one actually resulted in U UCF applied for a separate Trusted CI engagement. So another case of we just knew who to call and now it's actually a separate engagement with trusted ci directly so we really uh this kind of partnership is absolutely invaluable moving forward and it's something that um as we learn lessons it's really really helpful to share those back and forth so we've also learned that researchers are really, really driven in a specific singular way. They want to do their science. They want to get their research done. They don't really care about security in the sense of how security is being done. They just want to know that their data is secure, but they don't know what that means in terms of what to expect. A lot of times they do not know what to uh, expect in terms of performance and maybe even procedure. How am I supposed to transfer this data? What is Globus? I don't know how to use Globus. I've always used FTP. So if they don't, if things don't work as they're expecting them to work, they're going to get bypassed. Maybe that means copying all the data to a hard drive or a USB key and shipping it or something along those lines, but they will find a way to get their research done with or without us. So as inventive as they are, it's better if we partner alongside them because otherwise you can end up with something like this. And this is a slide I stole shamelessly from Jason Zorowski at ESNet, and he was using this slide to talk about Science DMZ. I think it does illustrate though, how we intend things to work from a kind of a networking perspective and how things were designed and the infrastructure and what the user experience actually is if they don't understand how to plug into that network design and infrastructure. They will find a way to get from A to B and sometimes it looks like cutting a corner. So I think everybody in the room has probably heard this before, move fast and break things. That's really super applicable when we're talking about technology. That's not a good <laughs> That's really not a good uh, way to process things when we're talking about people. We do not want to move fast and break people. We are better off to understand the impact of the technology and the people being, in some cases, forced, in some cases, asked. And however that looks, at the end of the day, the researchers we're involved with have to use this technology. So we need to better understand what kind of implication that has on them. So again, something I stole ruthlessly from another slide deck, but this absolutely is true. You can give a white paper to somebody, you can point them towards a web resource, you can give them all the information on the subject. They could read to the end of the year and have, you know, not have any time for a break, but it doesn't mean they care about that particular piece of information a lot of times our intervention is necessary on a personal level to kind of guide and make sure that they are able to 
apply the, the specific concepts to their specific situation. So um, that takes pardon, a building. I just, oh, go ahead. If I could just interrupt briefly. Uh, we've got someone asking, uh, trying to raise their hand to ask a question. For those of you who are attending, um, please use the chat to ask your question. Thank you. And I am completely flying blind as the presenter, so. <laughs> so the, you know, building those relationships, uh, part of what we've done is talk to scientists about what is actually most important to you. And the answers were stability, predictability, those type of things. If it worked a specific way yesterday, I want it to work that way tomorrow. And I want to be able to expect that when I come in the day after that, it's going to work the same way as well. I want to know that this is the performance I should be getting. I don't want to have to wonder about that. I just want to know that this is the performance I'm going to get day in, day out, that it's not going to be 500 megabit one day and 10 megabit the next day. And they want the technology to fit with their process of science. One of the amazing things about technology is you can, you can tailor it to any situation. We need to do that with their science. We can't give them something that technically works, but doesn't fit with their specific process. They'll abandon it. They will not use it. So if we can find solutions that don't affect those three things, they'll get adopted really readily. If it affects any one of those three things, it's likely going to get put to the way wayside. And part of that rub comes from just the view of the technologist. And I some background on me. I'm an old systems guy, network guy, and I come from an educational background, spent a lot of time working in K-12 school systems and that sort of thing. So very similar mindsets. The teachers in the classroom are interested specifically in teaching kids and the technology better fit within that scope. So what if I made changes for the sake of making changes because I always think of networks and computers and information technology as a constantly evolving, constant moving field. You just have to keep up with it. I expect things are going to be different, um, you know, a month from now or six months from now or a year from now. I can't keep doing things the same way. And sometimes I put solutions in place that were better, but it didn't actually help out the teacher. And we, we see that sometimes too in the R and E fields where, we can improve things, but if we're not optimizing on that access that they need, it doesn't help them. If we're giving them more bandwidth, but it doesn't change their latency, and latency is what they really need, then we're not helping. If we're making things more secure, but that security doesn't actually benefit the scientists, and there's no real world application for that security, it's just on paper, it's better, maybe we need to reevaluate that and see if it's really a battle we need to fight. And then this touches on something we've talked about a couple of times already, understanding the actual need, as opposed to the researcher saying, I need more bandwidth, and we just start finding ways to get them more bandwidth. Maybe the researcher doesn't need bandwidth. Maybe they need something else entirely. A lot of times they don't know specifically what to ask for. So these kind of interventions where we find out what they really need are oftentimes more value because it's not just that we're giving them things they don't need. Sometimes they don't know what to ask for. So putting technology in place is easy, but the adoption is the tough part. Again, just another example of your cosmology group, they don't really care. You could, you could list a thousand reasons why virtualizing their environment would be better from a technology standpoint. They wanna know if they can get their data from their sensors in a reliable, timely fashion so that they can be productive and they can do their science. And they want to know that their data is secure, but that the security isn't going to be so onerous that they just want to walk around it and bypass it. And the information is already out there, but again, touching on the, you know, a similar kind of vein, the old adage applies. They don't know, care how much you know until they know how much you care. If as, you know, groups of technologists, if we don't show a vested interest in the science that they're doing and we just point them towards a resource, well, just, just do this thing and you should be fine. They might've done that thing three times already and it didn't work for them. Or they may not have the knowledge to implement what we're asking them to implement. They may not know the right questions to ask. If we spend a little time 
acts as an icebreaker, we get the real information we need to help them. That goes back to the deep dive process where we ask them about their science. It doesn't, part of that is because the understanding of the science helps us develop a battle plan to, you know, help them with their network. But part of that is just an icebreaker. We care about what you're doing, so we need to know what you're doing. My last point was really sometimes they actually already know what they need to do, whether that's on the research side or on the technology side. Maybe it's a network engineer that's researched this to death and he's positive he's right, but he's never done it before. And he's worried about somebody higher up in the department coming down on him if it doesn't get implemented correctly. Sometimes they just need somebody to look at their plan and say, you know what, that's fine. That's going to work really, really well. You should implement that. And that can be an, an outreach option as well, is literally just affirming what somebody else is already doing. So that's pretty much what I've got for you today. Um, conclusion is basically just that we spend a lot of time looking at research and science and trying to understand specifically what their needs are and how we can speed their time to science. What bottlenecks and hurdles can we get out of the way? Because when they have access to that, they do better science. So there's some contact information here at the end and we are happy to work with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Thanks, Doug. I'm going to um, grab the screen back and just uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with Trusted CI and then that'll give us time to uh, give the present or the attendees time to uh, type in their questions. So. Um, thanks for attending this presentation, everyone. Uh, if you have time, please take our survey. Um, let me just grab this real quick. I'm posting it in the chat so that you can click on it. There you go. Um, we appreciate the feedback that you can provide and we also have a comment section so you can suggest other topics or maybe presenters that you'd like to see more from. And uh, also, uh, we have a couple of things coming up with conferences. So first of all, PERC is next week. So if you have not registered for PERC and you plan on attending, please go ahead and do that. But also we have a workshop uh, that's it's actually going to occur on Monday, July 27th. Um, for more information about uh, our workshop, please go to trustedci.org slash perk20-workshop. Um, I'll try to type that in real quick. Um, uh, we, the, the page will take you to our agenda. We have uh, I think it's six, six different presentations planned for our workshop. So please uh, go take a, a look at that and see if there's anything of interest that, you, that you'd like to see. Um, also, the Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Summit is still on for September 22nd through 24th, but we have moved to an online format. Uh, for more information about the summit, please go to trustedci.org slash summit. Um, we have closed the the call for participation. So uh, I'm, I happen to be on the technical program committee and we are organizing uh, or we are selecting who will be presenting, uh, working on the agenda, things like that. So if you want updates, uh, please, please go to our summit webpage. Uh, and let's go to some of these questions here. Uh, one question we have, how has COVID-19 impacted EPIC's work? For example, you mentioned the value of face-to-face -face meetings for deep dives. On the deep dive side specifically, it has had an immense impact. Uh, we, we don't actually try and do a deep dive remotely. We could start the process off right now with the questionnaires and some Zoom meetings and things like that. We could actually start it and then kind of schedule the actual deep dive event out into 2021 where hopefully we can travel again. But we had several on the docket for this year that we just said, we don't feel like we can do an effective job doing this over the phone or over a Zoom meeting. So it's had a really, really stark impact on that specific activity. 
The roadside assistance and the consultations, not so much because those usually revolve around some sort of Zoom meeting and a long email trail is most of it. Uh, we, we will hold a meeting when we need to, but most of the time these kind of issues can actually be resolved asynchronously because it takes a little bit of time to, here's a suggestion, implement that, get back to me with how it worked. It's not a real time type of thing. And, you know, scheduling time with your campus engineers, usually they're busy people. So that takes a little bit of time as well. So for roadside, it hasn't had a drastic impact, but definitely on the deep dive side, uh, we're basically dead in the water until we can travel again sometime, uh, probably next year at this point. Uh, any more questions for Doug? Uh, I'll let you go ahead and type. Um, uh, for any more information about our webinars, you can go to trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is August 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is Researcher Passport. And our speaker is Lily Hemphill from University of Michigan. And I have UM spelled out there too because <laughs> there's so many UMs, just like there's so many ISUs. <laughs> uh, we have a follow-up question here. Is there a publication on lessons learned on your researcher use cases and common issues faced? I'm going to put it, I'm going to couch it this way. I'm not aware that we have a specific lessons learned um, publication, um, but that's something that honestly I would have to check with uh, probably our PIs, either uh, Jennifer Shupp or Jason Zorowski. I, I believe we're working on one is if I'm remembering it correctly, that that's something that's been asked for and that we are currently working on getting that out. So once that's actually out and published, it'll be findable on the uh, epic.global webpage. And there's actually a lot of documentation on the epic webpage as well. Uh, again, that's epic.global, E-P-O-C. Uh, so our the results of a lot of our interventions are posted there, executive summaries and that sort of thing. So in a broader sense of if you want to see the outcome and some of the commonalities, you can read those executive summaries. But uh, we are working on collating that into one solid publication. Great, thanks. Uh, let's do one last call for questions. Um, and while people are typing, I just wanted to thank you so much, Doug, for this presentation. This has been uh, very interesting. And uh, do you have any other final thoughts or recommendations that you would like to, to present or share? We were kind of light on the security topic today, and I know that's something that's obviously of interest to trusted CI. Um, but again, it's the security part of it really actually ties into the talk I gave here because a lot of times there's a perception at differing you know, levels of research or possibly even low level network personnel that uh, <laughs> as my buddy who used to work in network security used to say, if you're doing your job, it means I'm not doing mine. Uh, but there's that kind of that roadblock mentality. But I think that if we are actively engaging researchers and uh, scientists and different network operators, we can overcome a lot of those hurdles and have good security that is streamlined, that is thin, that is efficient, that allows for research transfers at high rates of speed, but they're still secure as well. That security does not instantly mean you are going to have really slow transfers, that you are going to have things that just won't work or that certain doors are going to be closed to you. But it's a, it's a hand in glove type of you know, closeness and so a lot of these lessons learned and the things I kind of tagged at the end, at the Epic side where most of our questions are more performance oriented, but the same exact lessons apply that uh, the, the engagement, the community engagement piece is really, really vitally important. And again, that's why we appreciate having a resource like Trusted CI to draw on where we can say, look, there's an entire resource here that can talk to you about security and secure data and they're, they have a vested interest in what you're doing. They're not selling a product, they're making sure science gets done. Well, thank you for, for saying that. We did not pay for the, any endorsement from Epic. <laughs> we do appreciate uh, working with you very much though. And with that, I think I'll wrap things up. Uh, Doug, thanks again for presenting. I will be uh, posting the recording 
for this later today, ideally, as well as the slides. So uh, be on the lookout for that. I'll be communicating that uh, to our mailing list. And uh, we have some people saying thank you for your presentation. They really enjoyed it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun to be here today. Indeed, yes. So uh, I'll, I will end the presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month.